This is BBC News. I'm Nikesha Burak. The headlines at two. A climb down by Hong Kong's leadership after mass protests over their controversial extradition law. The Gulf tanker explosions. Two senior cabinet ministers accused Jeremy Corbyn of not backing Britain's interests by questioning if there's credible evidence for the attacks. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British Iranian jailed in Iran, begins a new hunger strike in protest against her imprisonment. A major review of hospital food after the deaths of five patients from Listeria is announced in England. Hundreds more people are urged to leave their homes in Lincolnshire because of flooding brought on by the heavy rain. And the internationally acclaimed writer Fatima Bhutto uh, talks to George Alagaya in Talking Books. That's in half an hour here on BBC News. Good afternoon. Following huge protests, the leader of Hong Kong has suspended plans to introduce a new law that would allow extraditions to mainland China. Now, the proposals have prompted big demonstrations, including one last Sunday, where organisers said more than a million people took part. Our China correspondent, Stephen McDonnell, reports from Hong Kong. And a warning, the report does contain some flashing images. The large demonstrations just days ago turned into running street battles with the police. It would prove to be the turning point in this standoff. The government of Hong Kong has been forced to concede that its controversial extradition bill has prompted ill will and division here. And the announcement came that it would be shelved, at least for the time being. I now announce that the government has decided to suspend the legislative amendment exercise. Restart our communication with all sectors of society. Do more explanation work and listen to different views of society. However, a vast array of opposition groups say the extradition bill means facing mainland Chinese courts controlled by the Communist Party, which can't guarantee a fair trial. And they say Carrie Lam ultimately still wants it introduced. Hong Kong people won't be cheated by the temporary suspension. Carrie Lam's comments will only make us more angry. The city enjoys freedoms which were guaranteed when the former British colony was handed back to China. A key pillar of those freedoms is having an independent judiciary. That's why for many people here the fight against extradition is a fight for everything this place stands for. And it's why they say they won't give up until the extradition proposal has gone forever. Protests planned for tomorrow will go ahead, with some calling for Carrie Lam to resign. The government the, uh, has not given up yet, so I think we still have to fight for what we want to do, because this is not the end yet. Delay of this bill may provide a truce for now, but with both sides digging in, this relief of pressure could also only be temporary. Stephen MacDonald, BBC News, Hong Kong. Iran is almost certainly responsible for the attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman. That's according to the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt. The US military released video footage yesterday, which it said proved Iran was behind Thursday's attacks on two oil tankers something Iran has categorically denied. Well, the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, says there's no credible evidence Iran is responsible, tweeting that the UK should ease tensions rather than fuel a military escalation. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British-Iranian jailed in Iran, has begun a new hunger strike in protest against her imprisonment. Her husband, back in the UK, also plans to join her on hunger strike. The mother of one has been detained for the past three years after being accused of spying by the Iranian authorities, a charge that she strongly denies and was sentenced to five years in jail. Well, our political correspondent, Nick Hurdley, is in central uh, London uh, for us. Uh, Nick, let's just start off with uh, something of a Twitter spat that's taking place uh, between Jeremy Hunt and... Uh, Jeremy Hunt and Mr Corbyn as well, over where blame lies um, with Iran. 
yeah, a huge row brewing over this. It started yesterday when the Foreign Office said that it agreed with the United States that Iran was almost certainly behind those attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Amman. In response to that, Jeremy Corbyn saying, well, look, we need credible evidence, questioning whether that evidence was actually there yet. Now, we know that Mr Corbyn is somebody who has questioned UK foreign policy in the past, and he also said in that comment that uh, he was saying that the, the rhetoric of the UK government was making conflict more likely. Now, his uh, shadow foreign secretary, Emily Thornberry, doubled down on that message on airwaves this morning, saying that it was important that the UK made its own assessments. Jeremy Hunt, though, has just arrived where I am just now, where there's a Tory leadership hustings taking place, and told journalists that uh, he thinks the Labour Party is in the grasp of virulent anti-Americanism. So a huge row uh, brewing between our two main parties over that conflict in the Gulf of Amman. Um, and news also regarding Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe. Just update us on that, please. Yeah, so Ms Radcliffe's situation and her imprisonment in Iran has been really at the heart of some of the tensions between the UK and Tehran in recent years. Mr Hunt, the Foreign Secretary, was with her husband, Richard Ratcliffe, this morning, sending a message out on social media that the Iranian regime now needed to listen, show some compassion and let her free. No signs that that's happened so far. Interestingly, the Foreign Secretary wouldn't talk about his predecessor, Boris Johnson, someone whose comments about Ms Radcliffe's activities in Iran have been blamed in the past for her imprisonment being extended, wouldn't criticise Boris Johnson on that. Mr Johnson himself has been at this venue this morning as well and wouldn't speak to us about that case. Well, just tell us what is going on at that venue, at the, the, the hustings taking place there in central London. Boris Johnson, absolutely the man to beat now in the Conservative leadership race, miles ahead of everyone else when it comes to the number of MPs backing him. We're told that he got a really good reception in there as well, that it was uh, hard for him to leave, as supporters say, because so many people wanted to get a picture with him. The other candidates, though, coming out very strongly as they arrived this morning, saying that a coronation, not going to the membership with the last two candidates, the Tory membership, that is, to let them have a say, would be a bad idea. And on his way in, I asked the Inter International Development Secretary, Rory Stewart, if he was concerned. Yes, that would be a complete disgrace. The public deserve a chance to look at these leaders, and particularly the members of the Conservative Party, who are wise, sensible, experienced people, deserve to have a choice. We should have learned the last time round that coronations are not the way to do democratic politics. I think most of the candidates, barring Mr Johnson now, accept that they want to be the second person on that final ballot. They think Boris Johnson's going to be on it. They want to be the person to go up against him. Sajid Javid, the Home Secretary, saying exactly that as he arrived. He thinks he's got the backstory to do it. Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary, who came second in that ballot of MPs, was uh, pretty punchy as he arrived, saying that in 2016 the frontrunner was coronated. That, of course, was Theresa May, saying, look what happened there, not a great outcome for the party, saying he wants to be more like David Cameron, who was behind in voting with MPs back in 2005, but came from behind to, to win the Conservative leadership. The, the message that the others want to get out is that there's still all to play for, but there's absolutely one man they're chasing. It's Boris Johnson. Nick, for now, thank you very much. Well, the House Secretary, Matt Hancock, has ordered what he called a root and branch review of hospital food after two more patient deaths were linked to a listeria outbreak. A total of five people have now known to have died. Production has been halted of the sandwiches and salads thought to have caused the outbreak. Lee Milner has the report. Five people have now died after eating hospital sandwiches and salads containing listeria. Two lost their lives here at the Manchester Royal Infirmary, another at Aintree Hospital. It's not yet been revealed where the other two patients died, but Public Health England has confirmed that seven trusts across the country have been affected. The Food Standards Agency herself 
are trying to identify how this could have got into the to the food chain. Um, that is going to take some time to do, but what we have done is um, taken steps to make sure that the product is no longer distributed and therefore the public and the NHS patients um, are safe. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has now called for a review of NHS food. In a statement, he said, I have been incredibly concerned by this issue and strongly believe that we need a radical new approach to the food that is served in our NHS. Listeria typically causes mild food poisoning, but can prove fatal if people are already seriously ill. The first patient affected showed symptoms on the 25th of April. Suspect salads and sandwiches were withdrawn on the 25th of May. Public Health England first warned about the outbreak on the 7th of June. The good food chain, which has been linked to the outbreak, has since voluntarily ceased production. As investigations continue, Public Health England insist any risk to the public remains low. Lee Milner, BBC News. The exam board at Excel has launched an investigation into how part of an A-level maths paper was leaked online. Blacked out images of two questions were shared on social media ahead of the exam yesterday. Well, Pearson, which runs Edexcel, said the images were circulated in a very limited way. It reassured students no one would be advantaged or disadvantaged and they would not have to resit uh, the paper. Well, joining me now from uh, Watterson is... Uh, Buckinghamshire, from Buckinghamshire, is uh, Mary Wag Wagland, one of the students who sat the paper itself. Uh, Mary, you sat the paper yesterday. Yeah. And um, how did you feel coming out of that exam? Um, coming out of that exam, I was, I felt okay. I mean, I tried my hardest. Maths isn't um, a subject that is particularly my strong point. I'd worked really hard over the past two years. Um, and I'd logged on to the student room to see how everybody else did. Uh, found it and sort of confer about the um, answers we had and that's when I found out that the paper had been leaked and it was honestly heartbreaking because you know you've put in so much effort over these two years for somebody to cheat and um, disadvantage you it's really hard. What, what do you make of Edexcel's response uh, saying that no student would be advantaged or disadvantaged do you have confidence in that? I have absolutely no confidence in that. I don't think they're acknowledging how widespread this um, issue is at all. Um, even just by mentioning it was only two blacked out images, that is not the case, or at least I'm under the impression that it was the entire paper. I have seen multiple screenshots of group chats with the whole paper in from the morning of the exam, but also Edexcel were aware of the tweets with the blacked out pictures a full day before, you know, the tweets were leaked um, on the Friday evening, uh, on the Thursday evening, sorry, and we sat the paper on the Friday afternoon. So I think they had an opportunity to do something about it and they didn't. And as well, if you look at their history, you know, their papers have been leaked for the past three years. Um, you would have thought that they'd be able to sort of come to a solution by now. Mary, are you aware of what's going to happen next? Uh, do you know if you're going to have to reset the paper? Have you heard anything from the exam board or from your school? Um, the exam board have given a very brief statement saying that we will not have to resit the exams, which I believe because of the enormous expense it would cost. Um, but I don't see how that they can ensure that we're not disadvantaged as students because given that this is a new specification, it's a linear spec. So this means that that paper we sat was one third of our grade. Um, and that's obviously quite a contributor, which is why I think so many people are upset because you just can't tell how many people have seen this. Um, and I don't see how Edexcel are going to be able to catch every single person. Um, I'm just going to take you forward to receiving those results. Is it um, August time? Is that right, when the results it, come through? How, yeah, are you going, how are you going to feel when you get that result and you've worked so hard and like you said um you know i understand that there were some questions on there that you would have only been able to answer if you'd studied higher maths i mean yeah. how are you going to feel if you if if you don't get the grade that you would have liked to have received well as i said i'm one of those students that maths isn't a natural ability to me so i have worked um really hard as i'm sure many other people have um over the past two years so um, for result, results day for me is going to be a big day of whether I'm able to achieve my target and whether my university are going to take me. And I've actually been more stressed since the exams have finished than I was during them 
because edXL have failed to acknowledge um, just how widespread the magnitude of this issue is. And if I come to results day and I haven't received my off, like I haven't um, accepted my offer from university because of um, an exam board, not only putting further maths uh, into our exam, but also I feel like the way they wrote the exam was very tailored to a further maths student, um, which is someone as me who only the single maths, um, I felt I did feel disadvantaged from it. And so if I have to suffer because of that, it's going to be absolutely heartbreaking because I cannot reset this exam. I will not. I don't want to have to go through a whole other year of that stress um, to meet my my university offer. So I really have no idea what I'm going to do if I don't reach my grades. All very understandable, Mary, how you're feeling. Mm. Um, good luck, though. For, Thank you. for August and uh, your further studies as well at university. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching BBC News. It's a quarter past two now. Nearly 300 more homes are being evacuated in Lincolnshire because of fears a river could burst its banks again. People have already been moved to safety from 100 properties in Wainfleet near Skegness after the river steeping overflowed. The RAF flew in tonnes of gravel to try to repair the breach, but new areas are now under threat. Well, our correspondent, uh, Michael Cohen, has spent the morning in the town. It was after the river steeping broke its banks on Wednesday after having two months' worth of rainfall in two days. The RAF and Chinook helicopters were drafted in to fill the burst banks with 270 tonnes of sandbags. There was good news last night when they said that had stopped the flooding and river levels were starting to recede. But people here still don't know when they can get back into their homes. And now fire crews work across the county to feverishly pump water out of those affected houses. This is a very difficult situation for a close-knit local community. Now, two teenagers have been killed in London in separate attacks within minutes of each other. Police are investigating after one was stabbed in Wandsworth shortly before five o'clock yesterday afternoon and another was shot in Plumstead. Police have made arrests in connection with each death. It's time for the headlines here on BBC News. And the leader of Hong Kong backs down indefinitely after mass protests over their controversial extradition law to mainland China. The political row intensifies over Gulf tanker explosions. Two senior cabinet ministers accuse Jeremy Corbyn of not backing Britain's interests by questioning if there is indeed credible evidence for the attacks. A major review of hospital food after the deaths of five patients from Listeria is announced in England. Now, the Italian film and opera director Franco Zeffirelli has died at the age of 96. In a career which spanned over 60 years, some of his best-known work included The Taming of the Shrew, starring Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, and Hamlet with Mel Gibson and Glenn Close. Lizzo Nzimba looks back at his own Zimba reporting there. Now, a huge cannabis factory has been discovered inside a disused bingo hall in Kettering. Police raided the building in the centre of the town and found around 2,000 plants and a sophisticated hydroponic system to water them. They said that the factory could produce drugs with a street value of nearly £2 million a year. What has surprised me is just how criminally audacious this particular setup has been. It's in the middle of a town centre location. Um, you know, normally you get these in like industrial type warehouses and like other more isolated locations but uh, yeah this is quite a sophisticated setup. Now people from black, Asian and other minority ethnic communities are more at risk of developing uh, some cancers and other life-threatening illnesses such as kidney failure and type 2 diabetes. They're also less likely to access or be offered hospice care services and now a new government funded study aims to increase take up rates across England. Our community affairs correspondent Adina Campbell has the explanation. Now, are you comfortable? Now, Retired businessman Dalbar Singh was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma two and a half years ago. Part of his health care plan includes coming here to his local hospice in Luton a service he and many others wouldn't normally consider. The concept of 
the Asian community have of hospice, it's a place you go to die. I didn't want to come here. There was a certain nurse at the health centre. She said, just try it, Alba, and then, then come and tell me. And I'm so grateful that I came and it's made my life a lot more comfortable. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks very much. A new two-and-a-half-year study, the first of its kind in the UK, will now look at the improvements needed to encourage more people from Asian, black and other minority groups access this type of care using more than £400,000 of government funding. There's been quite a lot of... Um, relatively quite a lot of research about establishing that people from minority ethnic communities are disadvantaged in the end of life. There's not a lot about what those disadvantages look like in terms of um, uh, health outcomes. There are many reasons for a low take-up of hospice care services by these communities, including cultural, language and religious differences. And often families take on the full responsibility of care themselves. But some doctors are also unlikely to recommend this kind of support in the first place because of a lack of understanding or fear they may cause offence. The UK is set to become one of the world's most ethnically diverse countries over the next 30 years or so. Take Leicester, for example, and this busy cosmopolitan high street. We hear all the time about the pressures of an ageing population, but there's also an increasing need to ensure our care services also reflect and serve a wide range of cultural groups. These women in Birmingham were brought together through a hospice service which cared for them and their children before they died. I didn't know what hospice was, I didn't have understanding because I had a child before who passed away whose life was mostly spent in children's hospital. The quality of life of one individual is so important to embrace that we need to look at community resources. We learn a lot and now we try to give other people information. The results of the new study will be published in 2021. Researchers say it will help develop real change for ethnic minority groups all over the UK with specialist training for those working in our care services. Adina Campbell, BBC News. Now, tens of thousands of cricket fans are converging on Manchester this weekend as India take on Pakistan in the World Cup. Both sides have large British fan bases and there were half a million ticket applications for the match itself, meaning that Old Trafford, which has a capacity of 25,000, could actually have been sold out 20 times over. Well, the game is expected to attract a worldwide audience of over half a billion, making it one of the biggest sporting events of the year. Sekunda Kamani has been speaking to some of the many Pakistanis who will be watching the game. There were cheers as Pakistan took on Australia earlier this week. But the night ended in disappointment for these fans in Islamabad as their team narrowly lost. The passion inspired by matches against India, though, is on another level. Is it a big deal to beat India? It's a pretty big deal, and not just because it's India versus Pakistan, not because of, but because, you know, like Real Madrid versus Barcelona, it's, you know, sport rivalry too, so that makes it very exciting as well. Sunday's game will be the first between the neighbours since a conflict in February that saw Pakistan shoot down and capture an Indian pilot. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to tell you that, sir. This advert spoofing his interrogation video in which he politely refused to answer questions while sipping tea has attracted both laughs and some criticism. You can leave now. Okay, sir. Ek second to go. Kab kaha leke ja rahe ho? For most fans, though, cricket is a rare opportunity to unite the two nations. I think we're primarily, we have the same culture and I think cricket can be used as a bridge between the two countries for peace and for stability throughout the subcontinent. And yeah, so I think irrespective of who wins, at the end of the day, a good game and peace is what matters most. Pakistan-India games have at times produced some of cricket's greatest moments. Players know 
tens of millions will be watching. There is a massive amount of pressure. And now that the Indian pa uh, India Pakistan games don't happen so frequently, there's more pressure. I feel someone who's in good form would probably be looking forward to doing well against India because if you do well against India, you could be a hero overnight. Come Sunday, grounds like this will be deserted. But because of tensions between the two countries, it's been years since Pakistan and India have been able to play against each other in front of a home crowd. Cricket fans will hope that can change someday soon. Sikanda Kamani, BBC News, Islamabad. Now this weekend marks the 100th anniversary of one of the most important milestones in aviation history, the world's first non-stop transatlantic flight. Now the journey by John Alcock and Arthur Brown lasted more than 16 hours. Phil Mackey reports on how...